I want to talk about some of the novel therapies. Uh, and I would like to start off on this topic by looking at some of the background regarding targeting CD30 in the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma. Yeah, so again, this is an agent that uh, probably has had the biggest impact on the systemic treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma since the introduction of combination chemotherapy programs. This agent uh, targets CD30, which is ubiquitously expressed on the Reed-Sternberg cells in Hodgkin lymphoma. And uh, it's a conjugated antibody, which means that it's attached to a poison, uh, and that poison basically gets uh, internalized into the cell, and the cells die based on that. And in the setting of relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma after autologous transplant, the response rate approaches 80%, which is remarkable. To me, more remarkable than that is my personal experience as well as published experience that some of those patients have very durable responses. I have one patient that's more than two and a half years after such a treatment and may in fact be cured. And we just spent a lot of time talking about the role of allogeneic transplant in the setting after an autologous transplant. I think that brentuximab vidotin may change that conversation. Because of its reasonable tolerance, as well as significant activity late in the disease, many studies are ongoing exploring the role of brentuximab vidotin in combination with salvage therapies, as well as in combination with initial upfront treatment. What research is being done to move bronduximab vidotin up to earlier lines of Hodgkin lymphoma therapy? So the most important study that's being done is an international randomized trial that is planning to enroll over 1,000 patients in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, where half of the patients will get standard ABVD treatment, and the other half get AVD with bronduximab vidotin inserted instead of bleomycin. Uh, the dose of brentuximab vidotin has been developed based upon a phase one trial that suggested tolerance of the regimen when bleomycin was not incorporated, as well as uh, outstanding efficacy. Uh, this is a very important trial. I think that uh, it's the only way to answer the question and that many centers in the United States are participating. So I think the, the, the paradigm was with uh, panabinostat. Panabinostat was being studied around the same time as brentuximab vidotin was being looked at as a single agent in Hodgkin lymphoma. There were parallel, design, parallel studies, one being done by Seattle Genetics, which uh, has brentuximab vidotin, and uh, Novartis, which ha I think it's Novartis, that has uh, panabinostat. Um, most of the patients who received panabinostat were European. and um, in general, it looked like the treatment programs were fairly similar. But at the end of the day, the complete response rate was much higher with uh, brentuximab vidotin, as well as the overall response rate. And uh, brentuximab vidotin was approved by the FDA, and panabinostat was not. If, pan if, the, if the panabinostat study was done uh, a little bit more quickly, I suspect we would have two drugs available right now for the treatment of relapsed and refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, and panabinostat would have been approved. Uh, right now, um, it, it looks like there's no longer clinical development with that drug. However, the HDAC inhibitors are undoubtedly active in Hodgkin lymphoma, and how they're going to uh, sort of play in the sandbox with our standard treatments, how they'll be able to be combined with brentuximab and vidotin, is the focus of clinical research programs in the United States. All right, and let's move on, Dr. Pinder Brown. What about the latest research with PI3 kinase, AKT mTOR pathways in Hodgkin lymphoma? Well, I think mTOR inhibitors also play a role in relapsed and refractory Hodgkin's lymphoma. So Everlimus has been studied. It has about a 40% response rate in patients, uh, the majority of whom have failed autotransplantation um, and has an extremely prolonged uh, disease control. I have two patients that have been on it two and a half years. Uh, who had failed autotransplantation like you had talked about within, you know, three months from their autotransplant. So I think in particularly transplant ineligible patients uh, where we're looking for decreased toxicity and prolonged disease control, it's a very attractive agent 
Um, there are also studies ongoing with Temsorolimus, which is an IV mTOR inhibitor, and studies going on with PI3 kinase inhibitors, a GS101, in Hodgkin's lymphoma, and we'll see. You know, if other agents uh, will also be useful in this setting. All right, Dr. Hamlin, it's up to you now. Can you elaborate on some of the data regarding uh, lenalidomide and uh, bendamustine? Well, I, I think bendamustine has been an exciting drug for many of us across non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it, it warranted uh, looking at it in Hodgkin's lymphoma. And Allison Moskowitz at our center did just that, looking at bendamustine as an agent for patients um, who were not responding to salvage therapy. And I think what we learned from that is that it is an active drug, um, that it was tolerated reasonably well. These were younger patients, but that responses were not terribly durable. So if you were using bendamustine as a bridge to get to a transplant, it was a reasonable consideration, but not, a, not an easy medicine to have durable control over the long haul. And I think it may have a role for certain patients when other salvage regimens haven't worked. Uh, lenalidomide is, I think, a, a fascinating drug. We don't know how it works so well. Um, we know that it has protein effects and, and can interact with the immune system. And, and I think what's attractive gets back to what Jonathan and I were touching base on before, is that when standard chemotherapeutic approaches haven't worked, it perhaps is enticing to believe that an immunologically-based therapy can re-engage our immune system and interact with the Hodgkin lymphoma. It's clearly got activity. It would be wonderful if we could parse out which patients do respond to it. And I think what one would hope is that as we continue to work with these immunomodulatory agents, we'll better understand how we can pair that with other agents and really get almost a vaccine effect if we can harness the immune system. So I, I think it may have a role. The German Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma group has looked at lenalidomide for older Hodgkin's patients as an adjunct to get rid of bleomycin. So I think there's some in enticing information. All right, and Dr. Friedberg, I, I almost think I don't have to ask this question. We're going to anyway. Will the future of Hodgkin's lymphoma treatment most likely include combination therapies with, with uh, some of these novel agents? Well, we'll make the answer somewhat interesting. So I think the answer, the easy answer is yes. We certainly hope so, that when you have all these active new therapies, bringing them earlier on may cure more patients. But we'll get back to the very beginning of our discussion where for large subsets of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, we're already curing 90 to 95 percent of them. So how we're going to be inserting some of these new treatments is not entirely straightforward, especially as we're working to decrease the amount of treatment. So I think that it's likely that it's going to be certain high-risk subsets of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma that are going to see these new treatments first, and it's going to take a very long time for the majority of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, if ever, to have these treatments incorporated into mm -hmm. standard regimens. And Dr. Pinnebrand, I don't